Good morning and welcome to worship at the Kingston Congregational Church. I'm Susan Berman, a member of the Board of Deacons, and whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are very welcome here. The flowers this morning are given by Eric and Cindy Ladd Anderson and their family in loving memory of Cheryl Ladd. Now let us prepare our minds and hearts for worship. The word praise occurs over 150 times in all our Psalter, the Psalms of the Hebrew scripture. On average, that's at least once per Psalm. We are called to praise, but what is praise? Is it just words? Is it actions? Is it attitudes? Praise is a frame of being, a spirit we enter into that has the power to change the way we see the world. It reorders our priorities and our assumptions. Praise is powerful and provocative because it changes the way we see the world. It lifts our eyes to the hills, to the bigger perspective, to the world around us where God is already active and moving and changing the world. And so let us enter into praise. Praise with our mouths, praise with our hearts, praise with our bodies, praise as the people of God who know from whence our help comes. We enter into worship. and invocation and Lord's Prayer. We praise you, O God, whom we know in Jesus Christ. We see in him a new word of love, a fresh vision of community, the power of mercy. May our praise ring with truth, humility, and awe. 
that in speaking what we know, we silence none. In singing what we, of what we love, our hearts open to all. Be this our eternal song, and these words our fervent prayer. Our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our word for all ages today is, is uh, carrying over from our theme, uh, which is God's calling. We are cherished, we are chosen, we are called. What does that mean? Well, in our invocation prayer that Susan just read the words, may our hearts be open to all. That's a tough one. If you notice, she just slipped that one in among some other phrases like, may we praise you, O God, with truth, humility, and awe. That one's a little easier. Next, she spoke of singing what we love. Yep, check that box. We love to sing our favorite songs. Easy. But then, in singing what we love, our hearts are open to all. Wait a minute. My heart has to be open to all people? Isn't that a challenge? I mean, what about the bullies? What about that smelly kid at school? What about the mean girls who made fun of me? What about the people who are mean to animals? What about those bad people on the news? What about the people who are polluting the earth? Can I just close my hearts to them? Do I have to love them? Susan says yes. And Jesus says yes too. In today's gospel, you'll hear a story about a man that no one wanted to love. He was an outcast possessed by demons, people thought. You see, he was very sick. And today we might recognize his seizures as epilepsy or his crying out as Tourette syndrome. But back then people were afraid he had evil spirits lurking inside of him. He wasn't perfect, so he could not be loved. But then Jesus came along one day and he stepped into the crowd and shouted, what about me? And Jesus, with a few strong words, expelled the demons. And this man was healed and welcomed back into society once again. You see, Jesus' heart was open to all, even the unclean. Yep, Jesus loved everyone, even the smelly kids. This month, we've been learning what it is like to answer God's call for us as individuals, as a community of faith, and in a community that so needs faith. What is God's calling for us right now? One of my favorite songs might give us a clue. It's called Here I Am, Lord, and it goes like this. Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. Wait, I've heard you calling in the night? Isn't our godly work supposed to be done during the day? Do we have to stay up all night to hear God's call? Remember those foolish bridesmaids who left their lights out? Can't he just tell me what he needs to say in the morning? Can't I just listen in on Sundays? Nope. The Bible tells us that a lot of people tune into God's message better at night. We heard the story about Samuel and Eli a few weeks ago, and that was we heard about Joseph at Christmas, having a dream that told him it was okay to marry Mary. That was at night. Have you ever woken up from a dream feeling compelled to do something? Maybe hearing the phrase sleep on it and in the morning you wake up with the perfect answer to your problems. Yep, God is speaking to us still, even at night. Maybe at night our brain is sleeping but our minds are more open to listening. Maybe at night, our hearts are more open to all. Because maybe 
God wants us to be the answer to the prayers that he just heard from the smelly kid who just before bed prayed to have a new friend at school. And God thought about his classmates and said, yep, I want Gigi to be that friend. I want Mia to be nice to the mean girls who made fun of that other kid. And so God's heart is open to all and ours should be too. And that favorite song of mine and has these lyrics. I will go, Lord, if you need me. I will hold your people in my heart. I will hold your people in my heart, even the smelly ones, even the bullies and the mean girls, even the people who don't fit in, even the people who don't agree with me, and even the people who do bad things. We will hold them all in our hearts with love. The power of mercy and the power of love. That is Jesus's gift to us today. And I think that is God's calling. Reading from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Some of our Hebrew scripture, our lectionary editors kind of want to prime the pump for hearing our gospel story by remembering a time in the Old Testament when the people were crying out for a prophet, afraid that without Moses, they would be lost. And Moses reminds them that God has promised to always provide a prophet, to always speak to them, to always be in their midst with a word of guidance and love and hope. And with that, we turn to the gospel. This is from Mark chapter one, verses 21 through 28. They, being Jesus and the disciples, went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching? with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Would you please pray with me? Oh, Holy One, we come to worship 
And we usually don't wanna be disrupted. We wanna be comforted. We wanna be restored to calm and peace. But here you are in sacred story, reminding us that even the disruptions are a chance for your power, your love, and your mercy to show forth. So may the word we hear and the love we receive not only bring us peace, but bring us disruptive mercy. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I have heard of church services that were interrupted for all sorts of reasons. When I was young and living in the small town in which I grew up, where my father was the local pastor, shout out to dad if you are watching. One day, it was a fine day out and we had a church that was very similar to this one except it had two doors at the front of the church and they would leave them open when the weather was fine. And so such was this day, the doors were propped open when all of a sudden, one of our dogs came prancing up the aisle all the way up to the raised pulpit like this one tail wagging just so proud of himself that he had managed to sniff out his person. Well, the dog was ushered out of the building and the doors were promptly closed and Buffer, we assume, went home. I have been in several services when someone had fallen ill and emergency services needed to be called and the service was brought to a halt. I have been in church when there was a fire alarm. Luckily, it was a planned one and all congregants practiced making their ways calmly towards the nearest exit. I have heard about services that have been disrupted by untimely sickness on the part of the minister unruly parishioners and wandering wildlife. I have officiated at a wedding where the time and the place of the ceremony, let alone the wedding itself, had to be withheld from the mother of the groom and the bridal party sworn to secrecy, lest she show up and disrupt the service. But to my knowledge, I have never experienced worship that was interrupted by a demon. Jesus not only faced that, but on his first day on the job, no less. Here in the Capernaum synagogue, where our gospel reading takes us for today, Jesus has just begun his public ministry. Only 12 verses ago, he was baptized by John. Nine verses ago, he fasted and prayed for 40 days in the desert. Five verses ago, he called his first disciples. Mark, who has been telling this story, has been speed narrating us through the first chapter, wasting not a word, lingering on nary a detail until now. Now, the narrative slows down. We're given a time and a place, the Sabbath. We're given the location, Capernaum. We're given extended dialogue and summary comments. Mark wants us to pay attention. Here, for the first time, but not the last, Jesus' power and authority will be revealed. Jesus goes to the synagogue for Sabbath prayers and readings and ends up giving the sermon. This is not extraordinary in and of itself. In first century synagogues, there were no ordained clergy. Services consisted of praises and blessings, prayers and readings from the law and the prophets, most likely led by the leaders of the synagogue and 
a lesson was given by any learned Jewish male. Jesus may have been recognized as a traveling rabbi and invited to speak. The extraordinary difference in this case was in how he spoke. Mark tells us the congregation was astounded at his teaching for he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. Scribes in this case refers to those who were studied interpreters of the Torah. They were intimately familiar with not only the written word itself, but with the oral tradition that was attached to it, layers of interpretation that augmented the text. The teaching of the scribes would have involved citations of previous teachers, opinions, shoring up their moral and ethical lessons with tradition and precedent and references to previous teachings. Jesus didn't teach that way. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Jesus spoke like one who had direct knowledge, like a primary source himself, like one with authority. The Greek word here for authority, exousia, literally means out of one's essence. Jesus taught not only what he knew, but who he was. Jesus was teacher, message, and illustration all wrapped up into one. He preached God's compassion, and then he lived God's compassion. He taught God's forgiveness, and then he offered God's forgiveness. He proclaimed God's inbreaking kingdom, the power of God to transform and make new a tired and broken world. And he demonstrated that power in word and deed. Take the Capernaum demoniac. That day at the Sabbath service, while Jesus is already rocking the congregation with his astonishing words, there suddenly appears a man with an unclean spirit. The spirit confronts Jesus and challenges him. Jesus' response is swift, stern, and simple. Be silent and come out of him. Unlike tales of other Jewish or Greek exorcists of ancient times, who use incantations and formulas and magical manipulations to ply their trade, Jesus simply speaks and it is so. Words and actions cohere. Proclamation and power are one and the same. This is some new teaching. <laughs> this is a new kind of authority. It is no coincidence that in the gospel story Mark sets out to write, he places an exorcism at the top of the page. This is a side of Jesus' ministry. Admitted, admittedly, we are less comfortable with, less familiar with, less experienced in. But for the residents of Capernaum then and Christians down through the ages, the message is clear. Jesus has come with power to liberate and set free all those who are in bondage. And what bondage could possibly be more severe than spiritual bondage, especially spiritual bondage rooted in fear. You can hear it in the demoniac's words. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? As human beings, we have a powerful instinct for self-preservation, which most of the time is a helpful thing. A healthy regard for risk and danger has allowed our species to survive. But self-preservation can become an end in itself can become distorted and dysfunctional, dare we say, demonic, Look, locking us in manacles of fear and defensiveness. 
the unfamiliar, the unknown, the other becomes our enemy. And from that perverted perspective, even God's love meant to transform and save us appears to be a threat. Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? Have you come to change my life, enlarge my thinking, dismantle my pride and my privilege? Jesus wants to take the shackles off our hearts, but there's a part of us that loves those shackles and fears their loss most dreadfully. My predilections and prejudices and defense mechanisms have served me well, kept me safe. How dare you, God, want to touch those? Have you come to destroy us? And don't think that the fact that this encounter takes place in the synagogue is just an idle detail either. It's only the first chapter, but Jesus, and we reading ahead, soon find out in chapter two that it is often those who wrap themselves in the mantle of religious propriety who are the most unfree of all. It is so much easier to talk about God than to actually experience God. It is so much more convenient to cite chapter and verse than to live in the freedom and the vulnerability of God's amazing grace. It is so much more comfortable to define holy tradition and sacred order according to what meets our needs than to ask what God needs from us today. Jesus has come with power and authority to break open our minds, our spirits, and our religious sensibilities and bring something much more wonderful to birth. He calls it the kingdom of God. And it is here and now, and he informs us it has come near. The so-called demons that infect our lives and our churches might not contort our bodies or foam at our mouths, but they wreak havoc on our hearts and minds, shutting us down rather than opening us up, confusing change with destruction or renewal with threat or difference with danger. These virulent and destructive defenses can literally take possession of us and destroy us from the inside. Haven't we seen that in our national setting? Fear run amok, anxiety stirred up and set loose, false narratives empowered and weaponized to protect a sense of slipping influence. We may not condone the actions of the mobs, but we can understand their feelings. It is fearful to have our world views questioned and our privileges challenged. It is fearful to be confronted with a diverse and demanding world. It is fearful to feel small and weak and diminished. And the temptation, the demonic temptation is to turn around and become fearsome ourselves, aggressively defend our presumed place in the world by putting others back into theirs. We can see this kind of spiritual warfare played out in arenas of every size, national, familial, interpersonal, and even congregational. The spirits of fear, resentment, possessiveness, convulsing us into conflict with ourselves. We may not agree with their actions or their politics, but we can understand their fear. For if we're honest, we have felt it too. And if we're not careful, the same kind of reflexive resistance to change and deforming defensiveness can take possession of us as well. 
those virulent demons threaten to undo us. But Jesus has only to say the word and the demons flee. Have you ever noticed that in the gospels? Demons, whether singular or legion, are simpering weaklings in the face of Jesus. Contrary to the Hollywood horror genre, harassing spirits fold immediately when confronted with the word of truth. All Jesus has to say is, be quiet, be gone, and they are. They mount no resistance. Mark is clear. Chapter one, top of the page, there is a new power in town. It is the power to open our minds, astonish us even, and the power to unshackle us from our most fearsome oppressions. Sometimes those fear-based behaviors are individual and sometimes they are collective. But the man from Nazareth, the son of God, has come among us and we have a choice to live under the thrall of fear or to live in the kingdom of God. Mark starts his story off with a bang to show us that even from the outset, Christ has come with power and authority to set us free. A new kind of authority, the authority of love to heal and transform us from the inside out. Jesus, your name is healing. Jesus, your name gives sight. Jesus, your name's above every other. Jesus, your name is love. Jesus, your name is holy. Jesus, your name Jesus, your name's above every other. Jesus, your name is love. come now to prayers of the people, our celebrations and concerns. Continuing prayers for Jane and her family. Jane is facing multiple surgeries, the first of which was had been scheduled for last week, but um, another health problem made it um, necessary to put the surgery off for perhaps as many as three months. So. They very, they very much need our prayers and support. Also prayers and uh, thanks and for the, all the sympathy cards for the passing of Eugene Knoyer. Um, this is a request from Andy and Michelle. Eugene Knoyer is, is Andy's brother and Michelle's uncle. The family was very, 
very grateful for all of the support. Let's um, remember um, prayers also for our friend, um, the, Rev the, uh, the Reverend Dr. Matabunye of Zimbabwe. I'm going to read to you a, a short note that he emailed to Michelle. Greetings and blessings to you from Zimbabwe. I trust this email finds you well. We are doing well, though faced with the insurgency of the new COVID variant, and we have so far lost six close relatives who have succumbed to it. So prayers for Reverend Malagunier and his family. And let's remember George Fitzell, this would have been his birthday and we all miss him. Finally though, a celebration and that is to wish Ruth Fittis a very happy birthday tomorrow. Let us be in prayer, holding these concerns, the ones that are on our hearts, shared or just personally known, and bring all of these into the presence of God that is already with us. But when we collect our hearts and minds, when we lift our eyes to the hills, we know that God is with us and here with saving help. Let us pray. We praise and thank you, O oh God, for this day, yet another day to live and love and serve, receive and give be your people in the world, to know your presence in our lives, to be part of your story unfolding with saving grace through the centuries and for one more day. Oh Lord, we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. May his name be praised. May it trip off our tongue and reside in our hearts, reminding us of Emmanuel, God with us, never far off. The kingdom come near your presence in our present. Always, Lord, may we recall and be restored by this life-giving name. And, O oh, Holy One, we pray today for the authority and the power demonstrated in Capernaum to be demonstrated in our lives as well. The power to untangle us from our fears, to release from within us oppressing forces, to unchain around us the powers and principalities that keep us shackled to fear and violence, oppression and inhumanity. And once more, oh Lord, to set us free with just a word. Come out, be quiet, be still and know that I am God. So Holy One, we take that deep breath of prayer to know once more that you are God, that your love is an authority in our lives and your power is a force within us and for us and that your peace commands the troubled waters and the spirits to subside. We pray this day for those whose lives 
are racked by troubling forces. We speak peace through prayer. We speak healing through prayer. We speak saving grace through prayer and in the name of our Christ. For those who are ill or lonely or afraid, for those like the man in Capernaum who are tormented or persecuted or set aside for those in our midst who are grieving, who are wondering, who are watching for the end of this pandemic and feeling the weight of it still. The Lord be with us, be with our loved ones, be with our community and with our world, we pray. We know you are, and yet when we say the words, it makes it so. We pray this day for the names lifted up here in worship, for Jane, for the family of Eugene, for the memory of Cheryl and George in celebration of Ruth and all our beloved friends who by their simple presence make our lives rich. Thank you, Lord, for this day, one more day to sing your praises and serve your gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, who has come among us. The kingdom is near. It is even within us. And the saving and powerful word of love. Amen. Beloved, 
I want to thank you for all the ways that you support the gospel of love in the world, the ways you serve, the ways you reach out, the ways simply by being who you are, you are magnifying the Lord and praising God. And thank you also for your gifts to this congregation. Thank you for your faithfulness, for sending them in, even though we're not passing a plate, for remembering the ministry to the people beyond our building that our gifts empower. Truly, even though we're not here, we are feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and visiting the sick. So thank you. And please, with what you can and how you can, continue to give of yourself that we might together give ourselves to the world. Let us pray. Everywhere we turn, O oh God, your world speaks to us of wonder and beauty, mercy and grace. May the gifts we bring and the lives we live be our response to your immeasurable love. Amen. Our closing hymn, Savior, again to your dear name. go now and take the name of Jesus Christ with us. Take it in our hearts, take it in our actions, take it in our minds that we too might live the love of God that disrupts the world with joy and healing and calms the frenzy of our anxiety and fear. Let us go now into that promised, provocative, and powerful peace of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.